Um, it was about 10 years ago, and I had a very bad day. I've, of course, had bad days since then, but this was a particularly bad day. It was one of those days where you felt like the world was conspiring against you, and you were really surprised at how mean people could actually be. So I was angry. And some people deal with their anger in different ways. I ran. Coming home that day, I was actually already in my gym clothes. I didn't even walk into my apartment. I just got out of my car, walked to the end of my driveway, turned left, and started running. Got to the end of my street, looked both ways, and crossed it. Got to the edge of my neighborhood and kept going. Got to the edge of town and kept going. Didn't really know where I was going. I just knew I was going to run in a single direction. I ran until I was utterly exhausted, getting passed by anyone who was even walking briskly. <laughs> Ultimately, this journey landed me on the doorstep of my friend John. He answered the door, perplexed at why I was there, why I was drenched with sweat and where my car was. Did not live close. But of course, he welcomed me in. He gave me a Snapple. He always had Snapple. <laughs> An ear to listen to my problems, and most welcomely, a, a ride home. John would actually become my roommate a few years later. We lived in a great cottage down by the water. We had a great time. In 2008, he would be diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma, a rare cancer of the liver ducts. He fought valiantly. But in 2009, John passed. He was 30. This was especially frustrating for me, of course, because John was a wonderful person. But only a few years earlier, I lost my nephew to leukemia. His name was Michael. He was nine months old. I've run hundreds of times in my life. But I remember that run the most. I had no destination. I had no backup plan. I had no forward plan. I had no plan at all. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know where I would end up. I just knew that I was going to run until I was exhausted. I would run until I wasn't angry anymore. And I would run until I found an answer. Didn't know where I would end up. But of course, I ended up exactly where I was supposed to be getting an extra 30 minutes with a friend whose time would come too soon. In 2010, I had the privilege of attending the Classy Awards. Classy Awards is a fantastic event hosted by a company called Stay Classy, which is aptly named because it was founded in San Diego, for you Anchorman fans. <laughs> Good friend from high school, Pat Walsh, started this organization with his friend. And uh, it's a wonderful organization. They created an online platform for fundraisers to develop, uh, for nonprofits to develop fundraising programs. And they put on the Classy Awards every year to celebrate all of the social impact that is happening not only in this country but around the world, and especially the individuals who are doing that. I was very excited to attend, particularly because I got to fly out to San Diego and hang out there. But uh, I joined it with my friend Matt. He was my plus one. And I was very proud of myself because both Matt and I that day went out to Macy's and we bought pocket squares. <laughs> and my pocket square matched beautifully with my outfit. We had to watch YouTube to figure out how to uh, fold a pocket square. There are a number of different ways. Uh, you'd be surprised since it's just a, a square piece of fabric. Um, but I was so proud of this that I talked about it all night. People who met me for the first time that night still refer to me as the pocket square guy. I had a great time listening to all of these inspiring stories of people who are creating change in this world, uh, people who are leaving lucrative careers to build schools in Tanzania, former Marines who are banding together to go all around the world to help areas hit by natural disasters, people helping the homeless, literacy, everything. So as I sat in those seats, I actually started to squirm a little. I was enjoying my time, but it was as if a mirror had appeared in front of my seat, and I was looking directly back at me, asking myself, what was I doing? 
What was I doing to make this world a better place? How was I using this gift of life to change the world for the better? The answer was painfully clear that I wasn't. I was just the pocket square guy. So that night, I told myself I'm not getting up out of this seat until I figure out an idea how I can create change. A few years prior, I found the sport of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. If you're not familiar with it, uh, it's referred to as the gentle martial art. It doesn't use any strikes or hitting. It is a ground art that uses a bevy of chokes and manipula uh, joint manipulation and leverage to subdue an opponent. Uh, it welcomes all genders, all ages, all sizes. And I loved the sport. I still do, of course. It rose to prominence in the first Ultimate Fighting Championship where Hoist Gracie, the youngest and the smallest of the Gracie brothers, was chosen uh, to fight. And he beat all of his opponents very swiftly using this form of ground fighting that no one had ever seen before. He put it on the map, literally, on the US map. There are a lot of misconceptions about jiu-jitsu. When I tell people I do jiu-jitsu, this is what they imagine. They think I'm taking my shirt off and going down to a dingy basement and beating people up. And of course, I do come into work every once in a while with black eyes. And I have had cauliflower ear and all of that stuff. Uh, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Brazilian jiu-jitsu is an amazing sport with the best sportsmanship and community I have ever been a part of. And I've played every sport imaginable, baseball, basketball, football. I played volleyball in high school and college. But Brazilian jiu-jitsu simply was the best as far as sportsmanship was concerned. And I knew that this was the type of community that could really create change. Because we're close-knit when you uh, meet someone who trains in jiu-jitsu, even if they're training at another school, which is likely, uh, there's no animosity. It's sort of a kinship, a brother or sisterhood. At the time, in 2010, when I was at the Class Awards, I had been training for two years, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was on the rise, and it still is. Tournaments grew from just a dozen of com competitors to hundreds, if not thousands. This is a photo of the World Championships in California. I had been to a few tournaments, and I saw lots of vendors with their tables around uh, the mats, selling their t-shirts, their shorts, their rash guards, their mouthpieces. But I didn't see any philanthropic presence uniting this community. So there it was. That was my white space. That was my opportunity to create change. So in those seats at the Classy Awards in 2010, a nonprofit was born. I would call it Tap Cancer Out. And it had a very clear mission to unite the grappling community around a single cause, ending cancer. There was just one slight problem with this idea. I had absolutely no idea how to do this. I had no idea what I was doing. I had a full-time job. And I freelanced on the side. I had a wife. We were going to start a family. I had so many things. I had no idea how I was going to do this. I didn't know how Tap Cancer Out would raise money or how it would get the community to care. But that didn't stop me. I knew I just had to start running. So I did what I thought we should do. Uh, we created a logo. We printed up some nice shirts, started a website, started a Facebook page, and started to drum up interest. Through a mutual friend, we're actually invited, free of charge, to attend a mixed martial arts show in Plymouth, Massachusetts, uh, where we could set up a table and uh, put all our merchandise out and, and sell and spread the word. This was fantastic. Of course, it was 175 miles each way, um, but that wasn't going to stop us. We were excited uh, to, to spread the word. This is going to be our coming out party. I was really excited. I had dreams of lines all around the lobby uh, just to buy stuff from our table. I had dreams of fighters demanding to wear our shirts when they walk out and when they leave their fights. We're actually the very first table uh, when you enter the venue. And they started a little late, so there was a huge line that was forming outside. And some of the people were sort of standing in the doorway, and they could peer in, and they could see us. Uh, at that time, we were supporting the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And so our whole booth was just blood red. It had all red tap cancer out gear. They finally let the people in. The very first guy 
walks up to our table, hands us $20, and says, large, please. This is it. We made it. We were going to make so much money. I was so excited. All for a great cause. We sold one more shirt the rest of the night. And two little boys came up and gave us $6 in donations. That was it. That didn't even pay for parking. Uh-oh. But we were going to keep running. So I decided maybe the mixed martial art fan community wasn't who we really needed to cater to. We needed to get down to the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community at its core. So I was going to call up tournament organizers, and maybe they'll lend us a table so we can uh, start getting to know the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community and the people within it. The tournament organizers who were at least li nice enough to take my phone call or return my email said, thanks but no thanks unless you want to pay uh, $1,000 for a table. Last time we sold two shirts and got $6 in donation. That's not going to pay for a table. Our whole idea was crumbling to the ground. But we kept running. A daily deal site called BJJ HQ, uh, I, I called them up and said, hey guys, would you be able to just donate one day for us to sell our shirts on your site? I said, absolutely. Send them over, and we'll ship them out for you, too. We did that, and we sold hundreds of shirts. And hundreds of thousands of other people who received the email saw our brand. A very well-known designer in the UK, uh, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu graphic designer, designed this wonderful t-shirt, which uh, shows a geisha giving an omoplata, which is an arm lock, to a demon in some... Uh, Words that I don't actually know what they are at the bottom. <laughs> it's been our biggest seller. We've sold hundreds of these shirts and sent them all around the world. We were starting to pick up speed. But our next decision would take a giant leap of faith, but it would be one that would change the martial arts community as a whole, at least philanthropically. I have to give credit to my instructor at the time, one of my instructors, Luigi Mondelli, uh, a third degree black belt, who after one class came up to me and, and wanted to talk about Tap Cancer Out. And he said, why don't you forget these tournament organizers and just host your own tournament? I said, I don't know. <laughs> why not? OK, we weren't going to beg tournament organizers to give us a table for free we would just host our own. So the Tap Cancer Out BJJ Open was born. I actually had a tough time finding venues. High schools would turn us down. They thought we were going to drag an octagon into their school and have bloody knuckle fights. I had to draw up large proposals explaining exactly what Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was, exactly what Tap Cancer Out was, and they still said, thanks, but no th thanks. We're an ultra conservative organization. <laughs> One high school, who my wife is luckily in the Athletic Hall of Fame, uh, she was able to pull some strings and got us space at Bunnell High School in Stratford, Connecticut. And so as soon as we got the venue, I created some flyers and I announced the date. Of course, I had no competitors. I had no volunteers. I had no referees. I had nothing, no mats. But I said, I'm just going to announce the date, and now it's up to me to make it happen. But one difference about our tournaments was that I wasn't going to gouge competitors on price. We could charge them $100 like other tournaments, or uh, we could charge them less and ask them to fundraise on our behalf and compete for free. And the more they raised, the more merchandise they could earn from our generous sponsors. And we also gave them a different reason to compete. They're not just getting out there to show uh, their talents. They were going to be able to fight for a cause, fight for other people. We created this poster where people could write who they were fighting for. We actually forgot to make it for our second tournament, and people were so upset. Our first goal was $5,000. We beat that in a matter of days. Our, so I'm up our goal to $10,000. This is for the first tournament. We beat that a month out. So I upped it for $15,000. Can you tell I didn't know what I was doing? <laughs> And we beat that before, uh, a few days before the tournament. 
Ultimately, that tournament raised over $17,000 for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, giving me the opportunity just in six months, the first six months of 2012, to present them with a check for over $22,000. We had ourselves a nonprofit. Our next tournament in the same place this past spring raised $41,000. We had another tournament in Massachusetts, the first time we were able to leave Massachusetts, and that raised another $15,000. People are asking us to bring the tournaments all over the country. People from Australia and the UK are trying to figure out ways to host their own tournaments to benefit us as well. And it doesn't stop there. People who couldn't attend our tournaments or host tournaments wanted to help us in different ways. Gracie Baja, a great school in California, has hosted a number of seminars where the competitors simply pay an entry fee and all of that goes to Tap Cancer Out and the professors donate their time. Even non-jujitsu competitors who wanted to uh, help our cause are running Spartan races and warrior dashes and using the stayclassy.org fundraising platform that we use uh, to socially fundraise online. The Carroll brothers wear a Tap Cancer Out shirt to every one of their mixed martial arts fights in honor of their mother who is a cancer survivor. Innovation doesn't conveniently happen when you book the conference room. Trust me, I work in advertising. We do brainstorms all the time. It's not the way it works. You can't plan for it. It's one of those things that just happens. So if you want to create change, if you want to be the change you wish to see in the world, you have to be it. If you want to create change, if you want to innovate, sometimes you just have to start running and meet innovation along the way. Thank you. <laughs>